Whether we're using CAD tools, playing the latest games, or rendering videos, we need our computers to run fast. While more money will always buy more performance, we would also like to maximize our money use since computing hardware is expensive. Those of us who cannot spend extensive time with a machine before making a purchasing decision often rely on benchmarks and specifications to tell us just how fast the hardware will be. Our job is made no easier by marketing departments from different companies trying to steer us towards their products with buzzwords and invented terms. It's not all rubbish, however, and companies do publish some useful information. Some of the most common specifications when it comes to processors are core and thread count. In this video, we explore hardware level details of how core and thread count affect performance. To explore these details, we first need to know a little bit about how processor cores run programs. A basic program is essentially a serial list of instructions that must be completed in order. This is necessary because a lot of instructions rely on results from previous instructions. If one instruction computes A plus B equals C, and the next instruction computes C plus D is equal to E, we need to wait for the first instruction to compute C before the next instruction can use the C value. However, all programs have parts that are completely independent of each other. For example, when sorting a list, one can sort several parts of the list at the same time so they can be put together very quickly later. When rendering a picture, each individual pixel can be rendered almost completely independently of every other pixel. Programmers can specify chunks of their program that can run independently, and each independent part of a program is called a thread. In memory, the program is stored as a list of assembly instructions that do very specific things. For example, this x86 add instruction tells the processor to add the values stored in EAX and EBX and store them in EAX. In a physical processor, EAX and EBX are super fast, temporary memory locations called registers. They are usually located close to the actual processing units for maximum access speed. In this example, the processing unit would be an arithmetic logic unit which takes two integer inputs and performs a range of arithmetic and logical operations. Modern processors will also have floating point units, which process non-integer values such as 2.25, 1 16th, or pi. Most times, the floating point units will have access to their own set of registers, used exclusively for floating point numbers. In most modern processors, including the x86 processors used in the majority of desktops and servers. There are different machine code instructions that tell the processor to perform either an integer or a floating point operation. A simple, single core, single threaded processor would have just these components hooked up to a memory interface. Through the interface, the instruction decoder can take instructions from memory. Data that is required by the execution units the ALU, or the floating point unit, would be fetched from and written to memory by the memory interface. To be able to run multiple threads or programs at once quickly and efficiently, two important techniques called multi-core processing and simultaneous multi-threading are widely used. Multi-core processing, as the name implies, simply adds more cores, which can process two programs independently. Simultaneous multi-threading is a conceptually more complex technique. Let's say we are sorting a list of people by age while running a fluid dynamic simulation. Both are easily multi-threaded, but age sorting mainly uses the integer arithmetic logic unit, while the fluid dynamics simulation mainly uses the floating point unit. If we run them on two separate cores, one core will have a severely underutilized floating point unit while the other will have a severely underutilized integer arithmetic logic unit. To make the processor more efficient, simultaneous multi-threading pushes threads from both programs through the same processor core so that no part of the core is just sitting there doing nothing. What happens at the hardware level to make this possible? To achieve simultaneous multi-threading, processor state hardware is duplicated and some additional control logic is added. Part of the added hardware is extra 
register is not visible to the programmer. The new hardware elements add a thread ID to each instruction and remaps each instruction's registers to these real physical registers. As each instruction moves through the processor, the processor keeps track of which thread the instruction belongs to and which registers are assigned to the thread. When the instruction finishes executing, this information is used to determine which set of registers the instruction's results are written into. The additional hardware also does some more complicated things that are beyond the scope of this video. This way, the integer-heavy sorting program and the floating-point-heavy fluid dynamic simulation can efficiently share a processor core to make the most out of execution units that would otherwise have been sitting idle. Multi-core and simultaneous multi-threading are not the only techniques to make processors more efficient. Other important concepts include out-of-order execution, pipelining, and superscalar processing. All of these techniques are implemented in modern desktop and server processors, and each technique works best in a different work environment. Virtually all modern processors, from microcontrollers to server processors, run multiple cores. It's relatively simple and scales very well in many industrial and enterprise workloads. For example, the Qualcomm Snapdragon 820, to be used in the next generation of smartphones, will have four cores. The top-of-the-line server processors from Intel and AMD squeeze up to 18 cores onto a single processor die. Intel brands their implementation of simultaneous multi-threading as Intel hyper-threading technology. AMD has, up until now, used a different type of multi-threading technology called clustered multi-threading in their bulldozer architecture. In the AMD implementation, each processor core is broken into integer and floating point clusters. Two integer clusters and a floating point cluster combine to form a module. In very simplistic terms, each module is equivalent to a core that can run two integer threads but only one floating point thread. There are, of course, limitations and drawbacks to multi-core processing and multi-threading. We already know that multi-core processing is not always efficient at using all processor resources, and there needs to be additional hardware to ensure that two cores do not mess up each other's parts of memory. Simultaneous multi-threading is not as powerful at multitasking as having two actual physical cores, and scaling is heavily dependent on a workload. Simultaneous multi-threading also requires a lot of control hardware to make sure that the two threads don't interfere with each other. Implementing any sort of multitasking is a complex task that requires a lot of engineering hours and verification to make sure nothing goes wrong. Today, core and thread count are just two of a vast number of specifications constantly being thrown around in the computing world. Understanding what each spec really means is key to getting the most processing power for your buck.